the next thing then to look at would be what type of tape do I have? The major focus for most archives are quarter inch and 150 thousandth inch wide tapes. And the common versions of that, of course, are the cassette. And this is 150 thousandth wide tape, the Philips compact cassette, and reel to reel tapes in quarter inch. The vast majority of recordings were on quarter inch tapes. We're going to talk about the structure of tape. And in this view, we're looking down on that little knife edge piece that you see going from reel to reel on the, the very sharp, thin edge looking down on the top of the machine. So it's only about uh, one one thousandth to two one thousandths of an inch thick, but there's lots of stuff crammed into that little space. So we're going to take, we're going to jump in the middle here. We're going to look at magnetophone bond type L and some of its successors, which is a cast piece of PVC with the magnetic particles dropped in. So the magnetic particles are cast into the base film. It's one piece, homogeneous. And while it seems like a very good construction, it is annoying from the standpoint of the dispersion of the particles in the tape varies. So you have huge level shifts that you can hear as the tape, as the particles, maybe some sag to the bottom here or they move closer up. So that didn't work all that well, but it was easy construction. So that's homogeneous. I don't think homogeneous tapes were made after about 1955. And the first one was made in 1944. Here we're going to draw in the reproduce head. That little line is the gap which we'll talk about in other sections as well, but we're looking down at the gap, so it's just a line. And these are the pole pieces of the head, and the coils are here that pick up the electrical signals generated by the tape moving past the gap. Uh, the gap also can is usually closed at the back. It's called a ring head for that reason. We have taken the tape off our tape machine now. As you can see, there's no tape. And we are going to put on coated tape. Now, this was the first kind of tape that was made, and it's the type that is still being made today. Uh, in about 1935, maybe a little bit earlier, BASF figured out a way of coating tapes with magnetic particles. So I'm going to draw this up from the, the tape head perspective. So this is the magnetic coating with all the particles in it. And then from there, we have the base film, which is the structure. The base film supports the magnetic coating, but is not active in the recording process. So all the particles, the magnetic particles, are kept closer to the head. Original tape from 1935 was coated cellulose acetate tape. That tape was being made up until the 1970s in various forms. Uh, with magnetofoam bond type C, uh, we basically have the same thing that's carried through to Scotch 111, which was the long time uh, acetate common use uh, audio tape for, and radio stations loved it. One of the reasons is that it didn't stretch. It broke. And now uh, you might say, well, you don't want your tape to break, but you don't want your tape to stretch even more than you don't want your tape to break. Because once it stretches, it cannot be recovered. But acetate tape, you'll find, is very common. This is Scotch 111. And now the easiest way to determine if it's acetate tape is to shine a light through it. 
Can you see that light coming through? Good. Well, that means that it's acetate if you can see that light coming through. And there are caveats which we'll get to, but that is the fastest way to identify it. I usually don't bother to take out the flashlight. I usually look up at a light source, pot light in the ceiling, window on a bright day, and you'll just see a glow of light coming through the acetate tape. Now, you, this is something you'll find commonly with acetate tapes. It's a piece broken off the end. You'll also find cupping. Now, you didn't see me go gasp when I opened this box, but many acetate tapes, especially, oddly enough, Kodak tapes, seem to be suffering from vinegar syndrome. And you will know that the minute you open the, uh, the, the tape box, it smells like vinegar, or sometimes the older German tapes seem to smell like lemon chicken. For some reason, it's just almost a dead ringer for lemon chicken coming out of the, the take-home Chinese food. Uh, so uh, that is, that's a warning sign because there is no remediation for vinegar syndrome. It's autocatalytic, it feeds on itself, and you end up with powder. We, we, we started with um, PVC because I wanted to just say about it and get it out of the way because it's, it's not really a player. Acetate is a huge player and it's how things started. But in North America, there was another alternative. In the end of World War II, paper tape was coming out. And paper tape predated acetate tape in North America. But what's amazing is this one has a little notch in it, so it will tear. But even with the notch, it's robust. It plays. And the oxide mag coat is fairly shiny, and the stuff sounds decent. We can now turn to the mainstay of late tape recording, which is PET film, polyester terephthalate. <laughs> Say that a few times. And it is what we all, ref some, we, we incorrectly refer to as mylar because mylar is a DuPont trademark and other companies make it as well. So you can't buy mylar from anybody for, but DuPont, but you can buy PET film from many people. So, but if we say mylar, we mean PET. And one of the things with PET film is that it stretches. So I've just now made a swizzle stick out of this that I could stir my drink with, but I can't play back the recording from it. So that is why acetate tape was preferred for a long period of time. With the advent of the PET era, the growth of that from the original low noise tapes which were an improvement in the early 60s, to the end of the 60s, we saw a new change, the addition of back coating. So now the two-layer tape, the base film plus mag coating, became three-layer tape, base film plus mag coating plus back coating. So the only change that's been made in this structure has been to add a back coating to the back of the base film that is rough and it has carbon black in it so it conducts static electricity away from the tape and also since it's rough entrained air can be pushed out and it allows for much smoother winding. So we have here a reel of back coated tape and you, there is a back coating on this, which is matte black. 
and there is the mag coating, which is a very dark brown on this particular tape. The back coating and mag coating changed in this era. Not in first, but the chemical manufacturers were working with the tape manufacturers to try to have more mag particle load and less glue in the coating and still be stable. Well, it seems they missed the mark a bit. But it's a very complicated taxonomy or breakdown of what tape does what, and it's really not going to ever be 100% knowable. Most of these formulations were trade secrets. They're not published. And storage conditions have a lot of impact on how your tape is going to behave today. So from that, the beginning of that era, with our back-coated tapes, we've seen tapes that suffer from all sorts of binder degradations. In fact, even in that era of the late 60s on, we find non-back-coated tapes that suffer from sort, sorts of binder issues. So one of the things that I proposed in my 2008 ARSC paper on tape degradation factors was something called soft binder syndrome. And that's an overarching view of tapes that have problems relating to the softening of their binder. Now, if you think of a Venn diagram, soft binder syndrome is the outer circle that includes everything. The most prominent failure mode to date has been what's been called sticky shed syndrome, SSS, sticky shed syndrome. And that is where not only is the binder soft, it's coming off and shedding on anything that the tape touches. Sticky shed syndrome, by and large, is remediatable. You can remediate it by baking the tape. And that causes the shedding to stop for a time. How do you know if it has sticky shed? Well, one way of telling, and it's not always true, but if you take the tape and run your hands down it, and you hear that kind of squeal, you know you're in for some sort of trouble, or there's a good chance you're in for some sort of trouble. So knowing that, uh, you would be more leery about putting that tape up on your machine to play it. You might figure that it needs remediation. That's not the only test. Another method, other than the squeal, of looking to see if there's sticky shed is, is it really sticky? Is the tape holding in like this and then coming off? No, it's coming right off the tangent of the reel. So that contraindicates that it's sticky shed. So this is a questionable tape. When you have advanced sticky shed and you have the back coat here, the mag coat here, as you pull it off, the mag coat will stick to the back coat and will, you'll destroy the tape if you try to wind a tape that has advanced sticky shed. As we all talk about these tapes, we develop a body of knowledge as to what tapes are behaving which way. So we know that the, uh, the digital tapes, many of them need baking now. We know for sure that the music mastering tapes analog from Ampex and 3M, the major ones like Ampex 456, 406, 407, 457, those all need baking. So this huge chunk of mastering tapes, it includes Scotch 226, 227, uh, Scotch 808, 809, oddly enough, not 206, 207, which were the first back-coated tapes from 3M, but 
all the later ones, Scotch 250 generally needs to be baked. So all of these go into the baker. My suggestion is if it's a known sticky t shed tape, the boxer reel lends you to believe that it is a sticky shed tape from one of the ones I just mentioned or is on that list. You hold it up to the light and it's not acetate, put it in the baker. One of the reasons that you don't want to bake acetate tapes is that the heat may destroy the tape base film. PET base film is not really sensitive to the temperatures that we bake at. I'm not going to give you those temperatures in this video. You're going to need to look them up because you should read the Ampex patent and see what they claim. We use the higher temperature of that patent and we use it for longer than they claim. What we have seen is we've seen that the baking time has in needed to be increased. Now, think of our Venn diagram, going back to our Venn diagram. We have another little circle. There are those tapes that squeal and they don't respond to baking and they don't leave a huge residue. Now, if a tape is squealing and it's suffering from sticky shed, shame on you for not baking it first. That's about as blunt as I can get. So beyond that, though, there are many tapes which will exhibit some sort of squealing, and that squealing is modulated on the audio. If you hear it coming from the tape head, you're also getting it in your audio. What is squealing? It's stick slip. So the tape and the head are like this, and it's like... And it's repeating it multiple thousands of times a second, which is why you hear the squeal, the tone. But what is that? That is a time base error. So it's FM modulation. It's frequency modulation of the audio. It's not a tone like you put an oscillator in. So it's nothing you can filter out easily. It has to be remediated at the time of playback using physical or chemical means. And there are going to be tapes from time to time that you're going to want to put on the shelf and say, talk to me. Tell me what I should do to you. Because there, it's just something weird. And that's where ArsList comes in. Because you can join ArsList and you can talk to all of us there. There are a lot of us who do this. And say, I have this tape that looks like this or does that. What is it? How would you transfer it? And maybe you'll get an answer. Um, and or maybe you'll get someone to say that's really tricky you better let a professional do it and if you are a professional then hopefully the professionals will talk to each other and figure out what knowledge transfer needs to be done 